Welcome back, everyone. I'm David Greenberg, and this is freedomvibe.art. Today's presentation is called An Introduction to Conditional Acceptance, Defending Your Rights Through High Word Magic. And folks, I don't think I can overemphasize this. This is going to be this is going to be one of my most important presentations to date. And in fact, I'm going to kind of let you in, let the cat out of the bag, so to speak, that I'm going to be taking my content in a whole new direction. Okay, what do I mean by that? Up until now, most of my work has been pretty much focused on the inner state. In other words, what you or I or anyone the state that we, the things that we need to do to empower ourselves to be sovereign and to truly embrace and embody our power as infinite beings and our place in this amazing creation that we find ourselves in. And I'm not saying that any one person has all the answers, but what I am saying is when you go inside, you start to find the answers. And so that's been the emphasis of my work up until now. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to add a whole nother layer where we're going to start to implement this mindset as it relates to dealing with the world around us and and in particular dealing with the current systems which we already know are basically enslaving us but now that we understand that it's all a mental game it's all based on your state of mind we can start to approach the game differently and that's what this presentation is going to be all about. And now you're going to implement it in the way that you interact with people in a very honorable way and in a way that you can get, you can basically experience more in life, experience more freedom, get more of what you want, avoid, avoid that which you don't want or need and that which, which is not necessary, and really just improve the quality of your life to an astounding degree. But it's built on that foundation. So if you haven't watched my other presentations, I'm going to encourage you to go back and watch them. And also, I'm going to be taking my time on this one. So in my previous presentations, I would try to spend very, I would generally spend very little time maybe on each slide and almost trying to pace myself to get through it at a certain pace, throwing that all away on this presentation. I'm going to spend as much time as I need to get the points across on this one because it's so, so important. And I want to let it essentially gel or marinate or soak in so I, I, and I want to try to address each point from different angles because this is not something you're going to master in an hour you're not going to master this in one hour so if you're here looking for a quick injection a quick hit you're in the wrong place but this will take you on the path and I'm fully cognizant that there are people who have been following me that might you know I might lose some people you know, because some people think that we shouldn't even deal at all with the current structures of power. In other words, the governmental structures and, and bureaucracy. A lot of people say well, we should just uh, act, you know, it's all immoral anyway, so let's just ignore it or let's uh, act as though. And then there's another group that's kind of like, well, we know it's all immoral and we know that, uh, or we know that the way things are being done right now is immoral, I should say. And we know that nobody actually has a right to rule anyone else. So, but to get by in life, I have to be practical. I have to pay my bills. I have to, you know, have a job. No, you don't. No, you don't. And that's part of what we're going to start to uncover today. Because in one video, there's no way I could expose all of this to you. But basically, what we're going to do, to put it the way one of my peers and mentors put it, you're going to be able to go in and out of the matrix. That's the best analogy. So if you saw, saw the movie The Matrix, you're going to be able to go in and out of the matrix, but you're not going to be of the matrix, if that makes sense. But you have to do something about it, and that's what I'm going to teach you. And the beautiful thing about conditional acceptance is it doesn't apply just to dealing with government, bureaucracy, financial institutions, things like that. Sure, that's a big part of it. But you can apply this way of thinking and way of interacting with people for any 
interaction where somebody else comes along and either makes a claim or asks you to do something or claims that you that you should do something or should not do something when you know full well that you you either have a right to do it or not um, and nobody gets to tell you what you should or shouldn't do beyond just basically being a morally good person okay which is really just a reminder of what you already know yeah i mean buckle up folks this is going to be a, a powerful one and um, i'm actually looking forward to teaching this one probably more than most of my other presentations i'm i'm i almost uh i had to kind of hold back like i i was almost of a mind to like spend more time creating this presentation but i said nope this information is really important we've got to get it out there so enough of an introduction having said that let's dive right in okay so the first question is who is this for is this presentation meant for you well it's pretty easy to figure that out see this is for someone who has a true desire a true desire to be free and who knows that freedom isn't free I know that sounds like a paradox and life is full of paradoxes, but this is one of them. Freedom is not free. What is the price for freedom? You've got to put in the time. You've got to learn the knowledge and understand it and overstand it and understand it. All three of them. And specifically, you've got to learn what your rights are. I've already talked about this a lot. What your rights are and how to defend them how to defend them and not just physically but mentally because in case you haven't been paying attention we live in a mental universe the all is mind the universe is mental it's all about your state of mind and all the battles all the great battles good and evil the war on consciousness it's all happening in the mind so if you want to be free yes you need to have a heart the heart for you have to care that's right. And you need to understand, understand and overstand how to ex implement freedom. How to actually implement it. And that includes facing the, the real threats to your freedom and your rights that are happening right now. And happening in almost every interaction because you are ignorant of how it all works. And I was too, so I'm not saying that I wasn't there. It's just I've taken the time to start to learn these things. And now you have an opportunity to as well. So if you're just looking for a quick fix, if you don't really want to be free, if you're not willing to make an effort, then you're in the wrong place. I mean, there's really nothing for you here. So I don't know what to tell you, except you may want to jump off the video. But if you are genuine in your desire to be free then I want to invite you to stick around because what I'm going to invite you to do is to acquire and then start to master a life skill something that's going to serve you from this point for the rest of your life in a very practical way that's going to get results that are going to specifically help you to implement freedom in your life so if that's you you want to stick around and all and I'm gonna give this is free information knowledge is, I think knowledge should always be free yes I I do charge for my time because my time is valuable and I'm just one person but if, when I'm teaching this is all free okay so here's the knowledge so if you're ready to receive it I'm gonna give it to you if you're not ready go off and watch Netflix or go play a video game or do something else okay um, if you just need if you're too busy to watch the whole video watch part of it and then come back I think you should prioritize this frankly I would make this the top of my priority list because when I've run across videos that are very important I've cleared my schedule out to watch them I, I clear out my schedule to watch an important video that you know when I deem it to be important so that's what I would recommend but you know being as that may this is for who it, who it's for also a quick dedication I want to actually dedicate this presentation to my parents and I want to dedicate it first to my mother who I can say with certainty 
has been one of my staunchest supporters. My mom has been there for me. She's been fan number one the whole time. And I really appreciate that. I really appreciate you, mom, for that. So I just want to dedicate this to you. I also want to dedicate it to my father because he has really demonstrated a willingness to roll up his sleeves and help me to implement some of the things that I'm going to be teaching you in this video today and more. So he's right there in the trenches with me. We you know we're we're fighting the good fight side by side. Okay? So having them supporting me in this way means the world to me. And I just wanted to express my appreciation. Now, if you're like most people, myself included, you have been literally bombarded. Bombarded. Almost like you're a target of a military campaign. And that's not far from the truth. You have literally been bombarded with legal and financial claims for your entire life. Certainly since you were 18, and for a lot of people, it even starts before then. Or you see your parents and those around you struggling with the same. And a lot of us, we just think, like it gets to, it becomes so normalized, get this, this is so incredible. It, it becomes so normalized that people expect things to be this way. That's just the way things are. Got to get a job, pay your, so you can pay your bills, pay off your credit cards. You know, don't get into a lot of debt. Always pay your taxes and so on and so forth. I mean, it's just never ending, never ending, never ending. And when you take a step back, like if you were someone that was as intelligent as you are, but you weren't from planet Earth and you just had a chance to kind of come and see this from the outside, you would probably think that people were absolutely bonkers, insane, psychotic, a complete break from reality. I mean, what the flying fuck? You know, and there's going to be some swearing in this presentation. So, you know, just take that as it may. Just consider that an explicit warning. Yeah, I mean, this is just how we are raised in this reality. So what are these examples? I mean, this is a long list and this isn't even all of them. But let's just think about it. Pay your taxes. You should pay your taxes. Be a good citizen and pay your taxes. Here, pay this bill, Mr. John Q. Public. Pay this bill. You need to pay this parking ticket or this speeding ticket or this whatever ticket. You have to pay child support and alimony. You have to pay this fee. I'm suing you and you have to pay this. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Miss Doe. Your credit application was denied. You don't have good enough credit. Go try again later. You need to show up for jury duty. You need to show up for this court hearing. You're evicted. Get out of your place. You're evicted. You need to get pricked or you're going to lose your job. Your home has been foreclosed. Here's the proof. Now get out of your home. You're under arrest. You've been charged with a crime. And you need to defend yourself and make a plea. I mean, folks, it's just unbelievable that a, a normal person in, in mental balance doesn't tear their hair out at the absolute insanity of it all. The absolute ridiculousness. And the fact that anybody could claim that someone is, is a free man and a sovereign who, ha who is constantly subjected to all these claims. Utterly astounding. It's just, it's mind-boggling to me that someone doesn't see that this is a system to enslave people. Th that's, that's the part that, that boggles my mind, that people can't see it. But it's understandable because, as we're going to talk about, 
people are in a state of somewhat denial because they don't know how to deal with it. No one's offering solutions. Or I should say very few people because I'm going to offer a solution today and I'm not the first to offer this solution. It's, I didn't make this stuff up. It's not made up by me. But this solution has actually existed for a very long time. It's just now it's coming to the forefront. But it, like I said, most people aren't really solving the problem. They're not really looking at the root causal factors of the problem. And so no wonder most people just remain in a state of denial of cognitive dissonance. And they lie to themselves as though this is all perfectly acceptable. Like this is just the way things are. No, folks. This is the way things are when you're a fucking slave. This is the way things are when you are a slave. When you do not own your own rights. And when you do what you're told, you're obedient. That's what this looks like. Okay? Let's just be super straight about it. But what nobody's told you is there's a very honorable and effective way to deal with this that doesn't require you to, what? To act in a violent manner. And nobody's going to stop you. You're not gonna, nobody's going to stop you. Nobody's going to try to undermine you. I mean, somebody could always do that, but it's not, you're not going to become like a special target for doing this. This is, this is the way things are. It's just nobody's teaching it. The solution, not, not the problem. The problem is it, this is a manifestation of people not getting it, not understanding the game that's being played or overstanding it. That's what I'm here to solve today. Not, not that these things are, are normal, but not, not that it are these things. We know these things are happening. It's just the solution is so simple, and yet nobody's teaching it. So I'm going to change that. That's what I'm doing on today's video. Now, I just want to say this because somebody's going to come along, some doofus, some numbskull, some total dweeb, is going to come along and be like, Oh, David, but you know, you're trying to help criminals get away with it. You're just trying to help them break the same system. But they're, they're still... <laughs> Look, let's just, let's just lay this to rest. If you have committed an actual crime, in other words, if you've actually violated natural law, the laws of creation, of, of morality, if you've murdered, raped, assaulted someone, if you've stolen something that doesn't belong to you, you've tried to coerce someone or deceive them, any of these things. So if you've actually done something wrong, actually caused harm, and you haven't taken 100% responsibility for it, in other words, you're just trying to get away with it, or you're just trying to be like a swift criminal to get away with it, then you know what? You deserve whatever you get. And this is not for you. This won't help you, frankly. Because this, this won't work if you're trying to use it for an immoral purpose. That's the beautiful thing about it. So I'm not speaking to those people. This is not for them. I'm only talking about so-called victimless crimes, which is an oxymoron because there can be no crime without a victim. So I'm talking about victimless crimes, so-called, where someone, either government agency or someone in government, some other agency, a financial institution, even a private institution, someone comes along and they make a claim against you. Something to take away your freedom or your resources or your money, you know, to harm you in some way, to take an advantage of you, to get you to do something that you don't really want to do and you don't have to do, frankly. You, you know, you're not required to do it. This is what I'm talking about, how to deal with this in a, in a whole new way. It's a whole new way to look at it, but it's all based on the same principles, right? So this is synthesizing everything we've learned so far about natural law and objective morality. And now we're implementing it into putting it into practice, right? So these are the kind of issues I'm talking about. Now, most people don't know at all, at all, how to defend themselves against these claims. Actually, I'll take that one step further. Most people don't even know that they can easily defend themselves against these kind of claims. In fact, 
defense isn't even, it may not even be the right word. They can just de decline them. De you know, so the, the defense is simply, it's not even something like a lot of force. It's not even like, oh, we're going to, I'm going to sue you. D sometimes it'll get down to that, of course. But in the beginning, it's just saying no. And the reason why is because people think that they have an obligation to do these things. Imagine that. You're probably one of them. I, I was like this for most of my life. Who am I kidding? But you, if you're being honest with yourself, just be honest, you are probably someone who you think that this is perfectly acceptable and you don't really you don't really get how to how you could get out of it because it's the law oh my god it's the law <gasps> no it isn't natural law is the only law common law is kind of a reflection of natural law it's really just an echoing of natural law in man-made law but it's pretty much the same thing it's just an implementation all these other things they're not law they're statutes statutes their guidelines within a corporate structure that corporations or business persons legal persons are subject to not human beings with rights but nobody told you this you don't nobody told you so how would you be how could you be expected to get this until you've been exposed to it and that's because the folks that are running the game, hello, they want to be, they want to win. They want to win. Do you not see that? Has that not been made abundantly clear that your opponent wants to enslave you through your own consent? Has this not been made clear from all the videos that I've made up until this point? I mean, if you're still not getting that, you're definitely not in the right place. And you definitely want to go back and start, you know, taking another look. But assuming that you get that already, which I think most people, most of you watching this will get that. They've made it so that unless you know what's going on, they've got you by the balls. They've got you, they've got you on a leash. Mentally, more than anything else. And they've got you running on that hamster wheel oh, i've got to make i've got to earn ten dollars an hour oh that's not enough how can i earn twenty dollars an hour all right i need to go faster how can i earn thirty dollars an hour okay fifty dollars an hour oh, i think i can do it <laughs> and then before you know it you're fucking dead and someone else is just taking over for you because you didn't know you did not know that you could fight this claim in an honorable way, in a simple, effective, honorable way that's easy to implement, that anybody can do it. You don't need an attorney. We're going to talk about that. You are going to be the attorney. And you don't need to be certified by the bar, you know, by the very low bar. I'm going to call it the low bar uh, association. Or any, and in fact, it's better if you're not. Better if you're not. All you need to do is invest the time and pay attention to what I'm going to teach you today. Okay? So what is conditional acceptance? It is a secret weapon that allows you to take back all of your power and win. Okay? It's a secret weapon. Why is it secret? Because nobody's teaching this shit except a very few people, myself included. But now, hopefully, when you learn this and you overstand it, then sometime in the future, you can teach it too. See how that works? So it's secret only because most people don't know about it. And it is a weapon that allows you to take back all of your power, all of it, not just in your mind, in fact, in your life, in the conditions of your life, and to win. You win. You're a winner. And not at someone's expense because you're just doing the right thing. You're just doing the right thing. That's 
That will become clear as we go through this why that is. So with that, another way to say the same thing is everything you're going to do is legal, lawful, and moral. It's the right thing to do. You are, in the, you are going to be in the right per objective morality. You are going to be standing up for your rights at a whole new level using the high word magic of conditional acceptance. And I'm, I want you to have this. I want you to have this, in, this weapon in your arsenal. Okay, so that's why I'm doing this. Now, you guys, if you were paying attention, and again, I know very few people are going to pay attention, so this is for the few of you that are. I'm watching the stats on these videos, folks. I'm paying attention. I know a lot of people drop off before they get the whole lesson. So for this is for you who's sticking with it because you care that much about learning this stuff. So kudos to you. So we use this word understand a lot and it has a very specific meaning. And I'm going to share on this slide, there's three different words that you're going to hear. Understand, understand, and overstand. Now, people have heard understand and they think they understand, understand. Not to be redundant. But do they really? There's a reason why it's understand, because you are standing under an authority. When you say, I understand, in, in, the, in the context of legal interactions, this literally means that you are accepting jurisdiction. You're under somebody's jurisdiction, some law, some statute, some system. In natural law, which is the only true laws of creation, we can say, I understand natural law, and that is a true statement because you are literally, you and I and all of us are under natural law. We can't escape it, right? It is the law of creation or the laws of creation. So it is correct to say, I understand it. But what about understand? Understand means to stand in an authority or to be an authority. So when you say, you can say, I understand my sovereignty or I understand that I am a sovereign being because you are that authority in that context. So you're understanding, you're not understanding, you're not under some other authority in this case because you as the sovereign are your own authority. How about them apples? I understand that I am a sovereign being. I understand the rights that I have inherently, the unalienable rights that I have. So that's understand. Overstand is you recognize and comprehend, but you are above the authority that, that you are recognizing or comprehending. So I overstand the United States Code, which is the law, this, the so-called laws of the United States, the corporation. Or I overstand the Federal Reserve Act or the UCC, Universe, Universal Uniform Commercial Code, or whatever. I overstand conditional acceptance. Not I understand it. So be careful how you use this word understand, because when you say it, you're literally committing you're literally agreeing that you're under an authority. And I still struggle with this because I've adopted this terminology somewhat recently. So you may still hear me slip up every once in a while and say, I understand when I really meant that I understand or overstand. So we're going to practice this together. So I've been chatting, chatting, speaking here and sharing all kinds of thoughts and feelings and ideas and, and knowledge. But what the heck is a conditional acceptance? What is it? How does it work? How do I use it? Let's dive in and let's learn. Okay, super important to understand this point. And again, if you've been, if you're already initiated into the occult, if you've been studying natural law, this is, you're gonna get this already. If you've watched my presentation, which you, if you haven't, I recommend it. It's called Understanding Human Nature. I talk a lot about free will and other aspects of our nature as human beings. So you may want to go check that out. Okay. But I think even if you approach this somewhat intuitively, somewhat rationally, and just really think about it and grasp it, 
you would see the truth that all these claims, the ones we talked about, paying your taxes, paying a ticket, paying a bill, doing this, doing that, following this rule, following that rule, showing up here, showing up there, paying for this, they all require your free will consent. They're all based on your consent. Ultimately, you have to be the one to agree to do it. Now, you may justify in your mind and say, well, if I don't do that, they're going to punish me. I might get slapped. I might get thrown in jail. I might get this, that, and the other. Okay, we're going to get to that. And certainly there will be claims in many cases that there will be consequences. But ultimately, if you look at it, and this is, this gonna, this is really important to grasp this, you have to agree. It's not going to be clear to you yet why this is such an important point, but I just want you to bear with me, okay? I'm not going to rush through this. I know people are like, get to the point already, man. No. If that's your mindset, you know, get out of here. You're not, you're not in the right place. This is not for you. It's for people who I want to level up, who are willing to put in the time and effort to make it happen. So all claims, let this sink in. All claims to perform an obligation, whether it's to do something, be somewhere, pay something, whatever it is, they require your free will consent or your agreement, which then turns into obedience or acquiescence. But you're the one that's doing all of that. It's you. It's all you. You received some information and you made the choice of how to act on it. And you probably did that again because you didn't know there's another way to do this. You didn't know there was a way out. A get out of jail free card. You didn't know about it. So you can't be blamed for not knowing. But just really marinate on this that everything requires your consent. All of it. Without exception. Again, I'm not talking about actual violent crimes where actual violence. I mean, yes, we still need to defend ourselves. I'm talking about claims, claims, people saying, pay this, do this, be here, don't do that, ba, 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 wah, 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 all these claims. Now, as we get further into this, you're going to see how you can respectfully decline. Say no in an honorable way and in a way that puts the ball right back in the other party's court without an attorney and most of the time without ever going to any court. Okay? Maybe even nine, more than 90% of the time or more than 95% of the time. You know, there will be times when you will need to show up. You may, it may be necessary to show up somewhere to make to make your case that's fine cross that bridge when you get to it but for 95 or more percent of the time you will need to do that if you follow this process another concept the offer thank you for that offer mr police officer thank you for the offer to pay that ticket so whenever you get a claim a letter a statement a warrant a ticket a bill, a document, something that's saying you must do something. You have received an offer. When someone sends you a letter, sorry, we couldn't approve your credit application, denied, you've received an offer. When someone says, can you please pay this bill? You have received an offer. Someone is offering you to perform some, some action, to perform, to do something. It's not a contract. It's an offer. Okay? So really, really get this. I want you to start every time that you get a bill, statement, a notice, a claim, a warrant, anything like that, any document, any physical document that says you must do or say or be somewhere 
or act in a certain way or give something. You just got an offer. You just got an offer. So now what does that mean? It means you have a choice. Choice of what? Are you going to take them up on the offer? Well, what do you mean? I mean, are you going to take them up on the offer? Well, if it's a bill, I got I got to pay it, no? Well, I do you? Well, if I don't pay it, it's going to be something. Uh, how do I not pay it? Okay, fair question. Well, we're going to see that. But would you agree with me that it's an offer? I'm offering that you do something. I'm offering you the opportunity to do something specific by providing instructions and saying, here, please do this. Okay. It's an offer. So what do we know about offers? Well, they're voluntary. Someone offers you something, you can say yes, or you can say no. How about them apples? Isn't that amazing? So then the question, of course, becomes, how do you say no? And as we continue in this lesson, we're going to talk about that. Okay? Okay, so you're saying, well, an offer to do what exactly, David? What? Well, the offer is very simple. You're, you're receiving an offer to comply with the details of that offer, whatever is being offered in exchange for some perceived favorable outcome. Here, I'm offering for you to voluntarily leave your, this premises so that I don't have to drag your ass over to court or do this or that or the other. Oh my God, I better comply because I don't have a choice. <laughs> That's it. They just they, they want you to think you don't have a choice. But you probably thinking, well, I don't. I can't afford an attorney. How am I supposed to? It's, and they're giving me 24 hours notice. How do I deal with this? Perfectly valid question because you don't you haven't learned conditional acceptance until now. So how would you have known? Right? So stop beating yourself up. But this is how it is. You're being offered to comply with something, some command, if you want to call it that, or some request, in exchange for a favorable outcome, which literally could be, well, we're not going to kick your ass. Think about the schoolyard bully. He's making an offer. Pay me your lunch money, and I won't kick the shit out of you. That's an offer. It's always an offer. From the smallest bully to the largest, to the biggest, I should say. So that's all that's what all the offer is. When you still down all these offers are just offers to do something to comply with the specific details of that offer in exchange for pretty much like not being assaulted or beaten or charged more money or whatever else they're claiming. And the favorable outcome is almost always avoiding some kind of punishment or penalty. Again, whether that's incarceration, paying a fine, something else losing privileges that's another one they threaten to take away your privileges got to get pricked in the arm or you're going to lose your job <laughs> as though a job were something worth having more on that coming up but uh you know basically it's all based on obedience to avoid punishment how do you think the slaves of chattel slavery in the 17, 1800s in the, in the American colonies and in other parts of the world too, because it's not only in, in the United States, who were physically chained up through the, all, of all of history whenever this happens or happened. How do, you think they're, how do you think they're incentivized? I mean, they're already chained up. They can still not comply, right? Just because I'm in chains doesn't mean I have to obey. Well, how are they incentivized? Because they're told, if you do what you're told, you can avoid a punishment. It's just now the punishments are not just physical beatings. It's even just the threat of something happening. And it's often a financial outcome, such as a fine or a duty or a tax or a penalty. But boy, they got your ass lined up, ready to obey. Because you didn't know there's another way. So it's all bullying. 100% of it is bullying. And it's all based on deception or coercion, right? Because 
you don't really have to do any of these things. You are not required to do any of these things. The only thing you're required to do is what? Don't murder anyone. Don't physically assault them. Don't initiate violence. Don't steal their shit or use their shit without their permission. Don't try to make them do something they don't want to do. And don't try to hoodwink, deceive them, or con them. That's all you got to do. So anyone comes along and says, you have to pay something, do this, that, 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 that. No. But they're getting you to think so. They're either coercing you to do it, some kind of threat, or they're deceiving you into thinking that you've got to do it. You've got to do it because it's the right thing to do. When it's not actually the right thing to do, the right thing to do is to stand up for yourself and say no. Okay? So, th- so all these things are pretty much immoral and unlawful across the board. It's the unlawful part that we're going to pay attention to because we already know it's all immoral. But now you've got to turn this around and use it, use their own weapon against them. That's essentially what you're doing here. You're turning around and using their own system against them. So it is lawful. It's by the book. By the book. And you're going to be able to take the high road. And that's why when you do this right, you become untouchable, invincible. Because you already know. See, you already overstand. You already overstand that they are immoral son of a bitches. They are, be, they are immoral asses. They're immoral. They're being immoral. They're acting wrong. They're doing the wrong thing. And you know it. Because you know natural law. You know objective morality. You know the difference between right and wrong. And that nobody has a right to deceive you or coerce you. Ever. Not even one time. Not even one time. Much less many times. So they are the bully. They are the tyrant. But they're going to threaten you. And, but their threat is always an offer to do something in exchange for them not hurting you or not taking your money or whatever it is. It's just that now we're dealing not, not as much with the physical aspect because you are going to need to defend yourself if somebody tries to physically assault you, of course. right? And that's a whole different animal. You're going to need to defend yourself, your body, against physical assaults. But this is all happening where? Hints. Hints. Big hints in the mind and then through words the power of the word who said the pen is mightier than the sword i honestly don't remember but when you see the rest of this lesson you may start to agree with that and 95 or more percent of the time It's not about physically defending your physical body. It's about defending your mind, your consciousness, your choices. Okay? So you've got to understand and understand that these are are all bullies. This is bullying. It's all wrong. Now that you know it's wrong, the next question is very simple. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? Well, you're going to conditionally accept their offer. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, folks, what's the sad truth here? What's the sad truth? And I know this is another point in the video where I'm going to lose people. And that's, I'm totally cool with it. But I'm also going to gain people. In other words, people who are tired, sick and tired of living in desperation. And sick and tired of having to bullshit themselves and they're ready for a change, then they know they're, you're going to know. If that's you, you know you're in the right place. And that's great. And I, I'm glad you're here. I'm really, really glad you're here because I want, I want to help you. I really do. But let's just be honest. Most people, most people live in quiet desperation, lying to themselves, lying to their own face. Imagine that. I really love my job. I don't mind having to work 
a third of my life away just to pay my bills? Bullshit. Bullshit. Deep down inside, somewhere inside the psychology, it may not be right on the surface, but somewhere inside, you know that this is wrong. You know. You know it. Somewhere deep inside, you hate the fact that you have to do this just to keep up. And you resent that. And you resent the, the loss of freedom. And you resent the loss of time. Especially as you do this more and more. Like as you have been doing this for a longer time. And some people, they'll even come out and say it. I don't really like my job, but I got to pay the bills. Imagine that. How defeated do you have to be in your own mentation to say something like that? How defeated do you have to be in spirit? How dead or dying does your soul have to be? How degraded does your soul have to be for you to say out loud, out loud, I don't really like my job, but what choice do I have? I mean, what the actual fuck? What the actual fuck? Are you for real? You think you're ever going to have a chance to be free? If this is all there is? Of course it's not. It's not all there is. You weren't born into this world to be a slave. Hello? But look at what the system has done. Look at how it's shaped your mindset to make you think that that is normal to make you believe that this is the best that you can do that you've got to just keep paying your bills paying your bills paying your bills accepting it okay go ahead and keep punching me 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 i mean it's insanity it's insanity it's psychosis is what it is. It's a complete break from reality. That's what psychosis is, a complete break from the operating conditions of reality, from understanding them. And even more for those of you who understand, overstand, and understand natural law, your sovereignty, and your power, shame on you for still going along with this bullshit. But you're in the right place because you're here because you know that you need to stop doing that. You know you need to take back control of your own life and your own choices, not of others, of you. That's why you're here. When you look at this, just how desperate and how pathetic and how sad that is, that alone should motivate you to want to keep going. I know it does for me. It gets me up every single day. And hopefully it is for you too. So my message to you today, if you take nothing else away from this, stop being a loser. I know that's probably backwards. <laughs> stop being a loser and a victim. Yes, I know that we're always going to have to we're always going to have to defend ourselves from something. We could we have it's we're gonna some some point in our lives we're gonna have to face something and we may fall victim to something. I get that. It's not what I'm saying here. So don't take my words and twist them into your little meaning so that you can make another bullshit excuse for yourself. Stop being a loser <laughs> and a victim. Learn how to defend your rights. Learn how to take back your power that you've already that you already have. It's not even a matter of taking back your power. It's taking your power and, and using it as God, as the creator intended for you to use it. You were given this power for a reason. How rude is that to accept a gift and then just throw it away? Have you ever done that? Have you ever taken a gift and just like, I don't really want that. 
It'd be better to say no thank you. It's more respectful, more honorable to say no thank you or to give it to someone else. You've got to do something about it. I mean, this is not, it's not, you don't just press a button and say, freedom, activate natural law, activate objective morality in all scenarios. I don't have to do anything. Ding! Make it all work properly. Pray to God that it will all work in your favor or that the mechanism is set in your favor. Nothing for you to do. It's all predetermined. <laughs> Bullshit! <laughs> It's not. There is a prerequisite. You've got to stop being a fucking loser and a victim. And you've got to actually spend the time and the energy to learn how to defend your rights and take back your power and to empower yourselves. That's, that's it. I don't know how to say it in a simpler way. So when you conditionally accept an offer, and don't worry, I'm going to explain to you what that looks like for those of you who are impatient, Losers, I can't wait for it, David. Stop talking so much. I'm a loser. I just need you to tell me what to do. <laughs> I'm just teasing your ass. Some people actually, they are that way. And I don't think you're that way. Hopefully you're laughing along with me. So when you conditionally accept an offer, you're putting the ball right back in the other court into the claimant's court, whoever sent you the offer, or whichever organization. It could be multiple people. It could be an entire organization. It doesn't matter. There's always somebody who's going to receive the ball. Right? If you threw it back, and if they don't, it's not your fault. You sent the ball back. The ball hit inside their side of the court properly as per the rules of the game. It's not your fault they lost the point. Now, they may pick up the ball and try to send it back to you again, but you got a point, right? You won that round. And eventually, if you're a good enough player, you're going to win the game. It's that simple, okay? So we, so conditional acceptance, one way to think about it is you're throwing the ball back in the other in the person's court in their lap, almost like a hot potato, like, there you go. Oh, there you go. Oh, there you go. Oh, conditionally accepted. Oh, conditionally accepted. Conditionally accepted. Okay, now we're going to talk more about what that looks like. But when you see it, you're going to see why that's what it is. I mean, it'll be so obvious. It'll be so obvious. It's going to be like a, a work of art, really. I, when, I, when I learned conditional acceptance for the first time, I was floored. I thought it was art, high art. That's why I call it high word magic, because it really is. It's, it's high, high word magic. Very high. Higher than most people will have ever run into in their entire lives or have scurried off to hire an attorney because they're afraid of it. When it's really not that complicated. So you're throwing the ball back, throwing the ball back, throwing the ball back. And the better, you know, just like anything, great analogy to sports. What happens when you play tennis over and over again? What happens? What happens when you play any sport over and over and over again? What happens? You get, you get better at it. You get better at it. Right? As long as you're playing with the correct form and you know, you're not you're you're using correct form in your sports and not hurting yourself not injuring yourself right but as long as you use the correct form and learn from someone who shows you the correct way to hit for example to hit the ball with the racket or to shoot the ball down the court or to throw you know to throw uh to the receiver whatever the sports analogy to to hit the ball with the bat you know i don't care what analogy you use as long as you do that over and over again in the best form that you can in the correct way, what's going to happen? You're going to become an athlete and a champion. Yeah. And so you're going to become a champion at defending your rights when you master conditional acceptance. Okay. So let's now use a quick illustrative example. Right? So this example is somewhat abbreviated for simplicity. This is not a template. Okay, this is not a template. Don't try to swipe this template. It's not a template. It's an outline. It's a framework. Okay, it's a first exposure to what it looks like with a really simple example. 
So let's say that the offer is you must pay this parking ticket. So you've got a parking ticket and somehow it is probably very worded in a very interesting way. It's not going to say literally you must pay this ticket. It might. Some tickets might say that. You may must pay this by this date, blah, blah, blah. But the gist of it is you must pay this parking ticket. So if we were going to verbalize that process of conditionally accepting it, then it would look something like this. Okay. Thank you for the parking ticket. I conditionally accept your offer for me to pay this ticket under the following conditions. Number one, you prove to me that you're the rightful owner of the street on which I was parked, right? Because if you're charging me for use of the street, you must be the owner, right? So prove that. Provide proof that you're the actual owner. You also are going to prove to me that you have a right to assess a fee for my use of this parking space. And because that's my money and I always want to make an informed choice of where I spend my money, you also need to provide a clear documentation of exactly how my money is going to be used down to the penny. And you have to agree to all of these. Oh, and by the way, you have 10 days to agree to all of this. And if you don't, either by omission or decline, then you agree to dismiss this ticket as though it never existed. And also, for, because you've wasted my time, I'm going to charge you some fees. And here they are. This is my attorney's fees for having to spend my valuable time wasting my time on this nonsense. Now, you were not necessarily going to say that, this nonsense in your conditional offer, but that's what you're thinking. Because what you're really thinking is, okay, thanks for giving me this piece of paper. You're completely full of shit, and here's why. And I want you to prove to me that you're not. Because you won't be able to, because you are completely full of shit. And since you are, and since you know you are, we can just forget about this whole matter. Oh, and by the way, for wasting my time, you now owe me $10,000. Starting to see how this works? Folks, I have already sent conditional acceptance letters in the mail. Now, I'm jumping ahead of myself. I'm just telling you, I'm doing this stuff. I'm not sharing this in, as a theory that I'm not putting into practice, right? There are, and you know what? There's a lot of people doing this. There are people who have had charges dismissed from them. Felony charges have been dismissed as, of, as a result of using this process. Not to mention other things. People have gotten their credit card denials reversed for using this process. Okay, there's an endless number of things that you can do with this, right? As long as you're in the right, you ha that's the important part. You've got to be in the right. Don't try to do this if you're not absolutely in the right and the other party is making a wrongful claim. Okay, and you've got to prove that. You've got to demonstrate it. It doesn't have to be a long proof, but ABC, we'll talk about that. You've got to factually lay out ABC, why, why you're right and they're wrong. Okay? And actually, now that I think about it, that, that was one step I left out of this quick example. So it would have been, you must pay this parking ticket. Okay, I've received your ticket. Here's what's actually happening. Here's what's really going on. You're really trying to extort me, by the way, or steal my money, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you say it in a very formal and honorable way, but you're detailing all the facts. And because of that, I'm going to conditionally accept your offer under all the following conditions. You prove to me that you're not full of shit, that you're not acting immorally, that you have a right to do all this. Oh, and by the way, if you don't, if you can't prove that, you agree to just dismiss the whole matter and you owe me $10,000 for wasting my motherfucking time because my time is valuable. Yeah, my time is valuable. I don't know about yours, but for these matters, the minimum that I charge is $1,000 a day for wasting my time, minimum. 
And that's just my own fees. We're not even talking about the legally obligatory fees for trust fraud, for securities fraud, for violating, for breach of contract, for any of these things that we're going to talk about. That's just my fee. And I'm trying to, I'm, I'm being reasonable. You know, some people literally charge millions of dollars or they, they make, they, they basically, yeah, they mean they charge fees of millions of dollars, okay? Which they have every right to do, depending on the case. Okay, so this is the general, quick, illustrative example of conditional acceptance. Okay, so here's the template again. It's not really a template, it's just a conceptualization of what's going on in the conditional acceptance. Mr. Claimant, thank you for your offer. Here's what's really going on, the facts. Here's what's really happened. Therefore, knowing that that is true, I conditionally accept your offer under all of the following conditions. So you agree to all of the following, Mr. Claimant. Otherwise, should you not agree to all of my conditions, in lieu of that, you agree that your offer is null and void. Or you agree to something else, some other counter offer that I'm going to make, which could also include assessment of fees, but could include for example, the granting of some privilege or some rights that you already had that has been withheld from you. So that is the template. And here's a hint. You don't want to use templates. Don't just go grab a template. Because there are templates out there of conditional acceptance letters. But that's not how you're going to learn how this works. You're going to do what I did. You're going to amalgamate information and knowledge from different sources and you're going to write your own conditional acceptance letter based on a true knowledge, understanding and overstanding this process. This is really important. It's all about being honorable. It's all about respect. Respect of self is respect of others and so forth. You're not being combative. You're not being belligerent. You don't counter a bully. You don't counter the bully by being a bully. Okay? It, it's kind of the verbal equivalent of blocking a punch. Oh. Oh. Nope. Can't do that. But notice that when, you, you know, when the martial artist blocks that punch or that chop or that jab, they're just blocking it. It may seem like they're being aggressive and angry, but they're just blocking it. Nope, uh-uh, you don't get to do that. Instead, I'm going to shove you to the ground so you can't hurt me, or I'm going to pin you, um, not, not because I want to cause you harm, but I want to stop you from causing me harm. So it's all very honorable. So now, in the, in the verbal way or in the written way, using words, using high word magic, it's very honorable. It's never combative. You're not mincing words. You're not using euphemisms. You're just being very straightforward. Here's what happened. A, B, C. Given that, you have violated my rights. D, E, F. Because of that, I conditionally accept your offer under the conditions that you rectify it by doing J, K, L. And if not, you agree to M, N, and O, including my fees. Okay, it's so all very honorable. And you can often say things in the letter like, even though you have breached our contract, even though you've committed securities fraud, even though you've committed trust fraud, I, in good faith, am willing to forgive that as long as you agree to all of the following. It's all very honorable. We're never trying to be dishonorable, rude, mean-spirited, ugly, nasty, bully, blah, 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 blah. Never. Might sometimes have to use strong language. We'll have to call people out when they do the wrong thing. But it's always honorable. Ideally, strongly recommended that whenever you deliver a conditional offer, you always want to do it in writing. Right? You can call either to attempt to address it verbally or maybe to follow up. But ideally... You always want to send it as a letter. And you always want to send it, if you're going to send it U.S. mail, you always want to send it certified mail 
or registered mail or whatever the equivalent is in your region. Or you could use a private third party delivering service as long as they have a registry of all deliveries and they can prove service. There has to be a registration of the service of delivering the letter. Okay. When you do this, this has a very beautiful effect. And that is that in common law, it creates a contract. So by virtue of me delivering this letter to you and certifying the delivery and, re and having it registered that it was actually delivered, we now have a contract, you and me, meaning the, the recipient. Okay. And being under contract, you are now obliged to respond. So you have an opportunity, you're given an opportunity to review the contract and then to give your response, which in the case of conditional acceptance would be to either accept all the conditions, to ignore them and then face whatever downstream consequences come from that. Or you might send back a response. You might make a counter a counter offer. So the claimant could make a counter offer or try to make a case about why they were right. Okay, they'll either do that in writing or they may attempt to do it in the, through the legal system. So one way or another, there could be a counterclaim. So you're going to need to be prepared that people, you know, the bully's not just going to lay down on the first try. It's rare. It's pretty rare that the bully will just lay down and say, oh, okay, I'm going to stop bullying you. All right, you're right. I mean, you have to deliver a real solid block and punch, a warning shot verbally in written writing or have to be dealing with someone who's maybe kind of a wimp wimpy bully not a really strong bully for them to just bowl over on the first go can happen and it and it will happen and it does happen but it's important to understand that you've create you've entered into a contract through common law with this other party by presenting the conditional acceptance as long as you send it in a way that it can be certified or registered through a third party service. And there's a rule and you can go look it up. It's called the postal rule or the mailbox rule that explains that in a little more detailed language, what that all looks like. But that's essentially what's happening. You are entering into a contract with that other party. And now it's up to that. They, they're on the hook to perform as per that contract. Cause you've already done your part. You've explained, you've performed by, delivering the contract as the conditional acceptance letter and you've outlined what has happened and what's going to happen next. And it's up to them to either perform or to face a penalty for non-performance. That's what it's all about. At the risk of repeating myself, what is this not? What is this not? It's not a magic bullet. It's not something you get to inject in yourself or plug into like in the movie, The Matrix or down. You don't just get to download this knowledge. You need to really learn this. And this video is just an introduction. So you need to learn this and then understand and overstand this process in order to put it into practice. So, so don't be sitting like, oh, oh my God, I've got to conditionally accept. Uh, not going to work. It's not going to work. It'll be sloppy. It'll be sloppy. And the recipients are going to laugh because they'll read your letter. Be like, what the fuck is this? This guy has no idea what he's talking about. <sighs> Ignore that shit. Send him another bill. Send him another notice. It's not a magic bullet, folks. You've got to implement this. You've got to understand it, overstand it, and then put it into practice. And that's going to take practice. And the first step, of course, is the study. Right? You've got to study. You've got to take this knowledge in and really let it marinate, let it cook inside your, your mind so you can get it. So stop looking for magic bullets. It's like the same thing when people, you know, the get rich quick schemes, like, oh, you know, where's the button I can press to make it all happen? Maybe I can win the lottery. No, that's not how it works, folks. This is the start of your learning. This video has just been an introduction so that you're, you, so you're even aware that this exists and it's a thing and a lot of people are using it, just not you until now. 
but it's not a magic bullet. What you're going to probably need to do in many cases when you start to put this into practice is you may need to send up to three notices to each party to get them to respond, to show them that you're serious, right? You're going to need to reinforce it. And maybe your fees will go up and the penalties will go up. And then if they still, if you still aren't getting them to agree to your conditions, knowing that you're right and they're wrong, in other words, you're exercising your rights and you're defending your rights, you may need to file a lawsuit in federal court. But you're going to do that from a position of being right and correct and empowered. And you're going to do it because you're going to overstand the process and understand your rights and your authority. You'll know it. You're not going to be shaky about it. And you don't want to be shaky about this. You don't want to be hesitating or doubtful or, you know, like uncertain. This works based on certainty when you know you're in the right. But just be prepared, just like any battle, it's not necessarily going to be won in the first go. You may need to send notices. Be prepared for that. The tip, typically, you would send up to three notices, and then you're like, okay, time to file the lawsuit. Or time to file a lien, put a lien, a lien against the property of the claiming parties. In other words, the... the uh, the parties to whom who whom are the recipients, we'll say, of your acceptance letter. I'm gonna have to do that. And if you've done everything right up until this point, you will have already won the lawsuit right at the time that you file it. Because you're gonna have done everything correct up until that point. It's gonna be very simple. And the system is in your favor when you follow the process correctly. You do not need an attorney for this. In fact, you should not. You should never hire an attorney. In my opinion, I, I would maybe. Some, let me take that back. Maybe there could be an argument for certain times of hiring an attorney, but not for this. Why? Because again, you yourself need to understand and understand this process. And when you do, when you understand it and understand it enough sufficiently you are your own attorney you present yourself you don't need to rep you don't need representation from anyone right and if you hire attorneys attorneys ultimately are there they work for the court system and the court system is a corporation all government is a corporation a business to make money okay it's all business, nothing personal. It's all business. So attorneys, because they are certified by the same system, they work for the system. In fact, having someone represent you is basically saying, I'm just a little child. I can't represent, I can't present myself. I'm not an adult. I, I can't present myself. I'm not smart enough. I'm a minor. <laughs> you know, and some, you know, a very young child probably will need representation because they may, they will not have had the opportunity to get something if there's a some kind of harm or claim against them. But as a full-grown adult, you got no excuses. No excuses. I every day since I started learning this material, I'm reading the Federal Reserve Act, the Uniform Commercial Code, the United States Code, other other acts and laws such as the Fair Credit Reporting Act, the U.S. Constitution, any document that I can get my hands on, anything that's relevant, I'm always reading every day, every week, I'm going through and I'm reading and I'm learning and I'm, I'm overstanding these statutes. I'm overstanding these codes and what they're really saying. Because what they're really saying is often different and many times it's the opposite of what people think they're saying because people didn't take the time to learn them. And hiring an attorney, frankly, it's fucking laziness. Laziness. Because you're not taking responsibility for yourself. And you're taking all the fun out of it. Because frankly, I, I, like I said, I enjoy writing a conditional acceptance letter. Because I know, I know, I understand, I overstand the material and understand it. 
I get it. I'm also empowering myself. I'm taking charge of, of defending my own rights and I'm being, you know, somewhat creative in making my case, you know, using my own, using words that I, I came up with in my own voice. I'm using, I'm expressing my own voice through the written word. I don't want an attorney to do any of that shit for me. Now, I don't mind people who have knowledge, more knowledge than I do in the statutes. If they want to explain or teach something, I'm open to that. Of course, I'm open to education, but I don't need someone to represent me. What? Represent me? I present myself. I am the living man. I'm the human being. I'm the one that gets to present myself. I present myself and I stand up for myself. That's it. That's the mindset you need in order to implement this. You're not going to hire someone to help you do this. Again, you can hire people to teach you as much if you want to invest in a program. And there are programs out there where you can dive deep into these and related topics. That's cool. Nothing wrong with that. But if you would just take the time even to go through the free information that's being shared out there and really take the time to learn it and understand it, that's all you need to do. And you'll know. You'll know when you've you've started to reach the point where you have a competent, conf, you know, a, a conscious competence related to it. It'll be pretty clear. You'll know. This next point is going to open up a whole can of worms that I'm not going to be able to dive into completely on this first video. But I have to at least mention it to kind of get your mind going. And I'm going to, towards the end of the presentation, I'm going to share a couple of other educators who influenced me and from whom you can continue to deepen your overstanding and understanding of this material, okay? And, um, but here's the thing. When you write a conditional acceptance letter, you are writing it as the living man or woman, the natural human being, who is a beneficiary of your public trust. And you're like, say what, Dave? You're public who? What are you talking about? I'm talking mainly about the United States corporation because this is the territory whose corporation under which I was born and the, and the statutes of which my entities are subject, right? But there's pretty much an analog in most countries in the world that follow this system. So if you're not, from, if you're not born in the United States of America, that's cool. You can still get something out of this, but I'm going to use the United States systems as an example here. Okay. So every more man or woman who's born on the land of the United States, or I would say nearly every, because there are some exceptions, but the vast majority, you are assigned shortly after birth, you are made the beneficiary of a Sestuke trust that is administered by the Social Security Administration. What is a Sestake trust you're saying? Like, what is he talking about? Sestake simply means he who lives or she who lives. It's kind of bastardized from the French. It's not an exact translation. But the idea is for every living man or woman, there's a trust, a public, and it's a public trust because it's administered by the Social Security Administration. And you guessed it, in the United States at least, the account number or the unique identifier for that Sestake trust is your social security number and the name of the trust just to make things confusing and this is there's a reason they do this it's simply your name in all capital letters and that's why on all your tax returns and all your bills on all your or most of them most of your bills most of your um, utility bills you know leases mortgage whatever legal documents on the vast majority of them when you sign personally it's going to have your name in all capital letters and probably your social security number either on that same document or in some part of that process in some part of the process you will have given over your social security number in some part of whether it was in the application or at some point right checking your credit whatever it is so your your social security number will be in play and your name will appear on the contract or on the documents as name in all caps. It might be capitalized, meaning the first letter is cap, 
It might be with or without your middle initial. It might be your middle name spelled out or absent. It's still referring to the same thing. But the official version is all caps, first name, middle initial, last name. So in my case, it's David O. Greenberg. And it, in all the bills and all the receipts, it's always, it always has my name in all cap letters. That's not me. That ain't me. That's my public trust entity. That's the principle. That's the public corporation, the corporation that was created for the administration of government because it was created by a government agency at the request of my parents, as all parents do in this scenario, because when it's granted, the child is recently born. So somebody is granting it. And when the child, when I became 18, or when you become 18, you suddenly become the authorized agent and the attorney in fact for that trust, because now you're an adult under the eyes of the statutes. So you now have a legal right under that statute to manage a trust, but it's not you. So if someone calls you up and says, can I speak to Mr. Greenberg or Mrs. Smith? That's not you. That's your trust. They're trying to get you to act as though you are the same thing as your trust. And you ain't. You ain't no such thing. You are not your trust. Your trust is a public corporation. It's a, it's a trust, which means that there are trustees who are responsible for administering it. And you are the beneficiary, which means you get to benefit from the trust, from the money that's in the trust. You get to benefit. It doesn't mean you can go and withdraw the money like from an ATM. That's not what it means. But you're the beneficiary. So all these pay the bills, pay the taxes, it's all being sent to your trust. In fact, only your trust can be a taxpayer. You cannot be a taxpayer. No, you can't. No living man or woman can be a taxpayer. Only the trust. So all the claims, you know, only the trust can be sued. Only the trust can be summoned to court. Only the trust can be faced with charges in a court. Because there is no interface between this system and a living man, except that the, the living man or woman is the authorized agent and attorney of fact for the trust. Okay? So all this is to say is when you create conditional acceptance letters, you need to make it very clear that there's you know that you are acting as the on behalf you are writing on behalf of the trust which is the party that's being claimed to do something in this case and as you're going to see as you get deeper into this because you're the beneficiary of that trust and because the people who are making these claims against you are trustees then they always have a fiduciary duty to act in your best interest if when they violate that they're going against all the statutes and they can be penalized for that. Okay? So, big topic. I encourage you to go read more about this, uh, but it's really important to remember that at least people born in the United States of America, unincorporated, most of us have a CESTK trust with our all caps name and a social security number, so it's the unique account number. And when we present that information to third parties, then they become a trustee because now we have entrusted them to take some kind of fiduciary action with respect to the trust. But we can't do that. We're the beneficiary. You can't decide how to use that money, but you can you can entrust others to take on that role. So you're the sole beneficiary of your trust. I'm talking about the Sestake Trust. You're also also can be an attorney in fact for your trust and the authorized agent meaning you're allowed to sign on behalf of the trust you're allowed to sign documents that say i'm hereby putting this trust into play it's it now may be used but since you're not the trustee you're not able to directly manipulate that account okay this is something that a lot of people think they can get around why would you want to do that you're the beneficiary already all you have to do is enforce that and make sure that every trustee is always acting in your best interest. So if you need a credit card, it's in your best interest for them to extend a line of credit in exchange for your promise to pay, right? In exchange for your securing that line of credit and that funds being secured from your SESTK trust, which definitely has the funds in it to cover that line of credit. So it's already paid for. So you have every right to that 
and it's in your benefit. But you have to enforce that, okay? And you have to enforce that by enforcing the role of the trustees who are these third parties which, wh whose claims you are going to conditionally accept. And by the way, I'm going to, below the video, provide links to all the major sources of information that I've drawn upon to present this information, who I've been learning from, which documents I've been reading, and so forth. So I'm going to provide you kind of like a bibliography so you can go do your own research, okay? So I'm going to provide some starting links because, uh, yeah, I mean, if you just go to Google, you'll be able to find some of this, but some of it, maybe it's not going to jump out at you, so I'm going to make it a little easier by giving you a little bibliography, okay? Just to take away the last excuses from someone saying, oh, I can't find the information, where is it? You know, it can't be true. No. I'm going to give you all the, I'm going to give you pointers to where to find this. So let's go back to the conditional acceptance letter. So now you're writing the letter. So in the open, opening part of the letter, you need to explain after you've presented yourself and you say, I'm the beneficiary, I'm the attorney in fact for the trust, which is so, so, so such and such with social security number such and such without prejudice. So you're reserving all your rights. And then you say, and then you enter the recipients. And usually this will be, it depends on the scenario. If you're dealing with a bank, you know, a financial institution or a bank, you'll probably send it to the CEO and the CFO, the chief financial officer. And you might copy the attorney general of the same state where that bank is based or where you're based and then the U.S. attorney general. Or you might include the controller of the currency of the U.S. Treasury and the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. Okay, it just depends or some combination. If it's a, a legal matter where there is a, a police officer and a judge involved, they might be the recipients. The judge, the presiding judge, the police officer who arrested you or gave you the ticket and so forth. And then again, the attorney general might be copied on it as a witness. Okay. So these are the recipients because they are all, because you're, again, your social security number is in play in all these scenarios, your all caps name, which is your the public trust, the SESTIG trust, that's the party that's being claimed. Okay. You're just the authorized agent. You're the beneficiary. So you need to stipulate who everybody is and you're reinforcing the fact that they're all trustees you're just reminding them you're you're calling them you're saying for example john q ceo trustee of of the trust david o greenberg just to emphasize the fact that they are a trustee which puts the onus on them to always act in your benefit as the beneficiary okay and then whatever their titles are whatever you know corporate entity they're representing or government agency their address their complete address which you're going to mail it to and right after that, you need to say in one, in just a brief, you don't need to do this, but I recommend a few sentences to summarize. Here's why I'm writing this letter. Here's, here's how this all came about. You just kind of give a nice summary. Here's the purpose of this letter. You know, kind of the high level. Here's why I'm writing you because you're completely full of shit. <laughs> And, he, and I'm going to, you know, in this letter, I'm going to demonstrate why you're completely full of shit. You're, you're trampling on all my rights. You've got it all backwards. You're violating numerous statutes that you have claimed to be under the jurisdiction of. And, and the trust certainly is under the jurisdiction of. And here, here's what I'm going to do about it. Then what you can do, and this is optional. I like to do this more in the footnotes rather than having a whole section. Is... You're going to become super cozy with Black's Law, fourth edition. That's a, that's a law dictionary with extensive definitions. And by the way, don't ever use a word unless you absolutely overstand the meaning of the word. Don't just start throwing out these terms unless you truly overstand them. Because that will get you into trouble and you might lose just by using a word incorrectly. Okay, so make sure you, understand, you overstand and possibly understand the meanings of these words. Okay, so look up terms that are relevant and make sure you have precise definitions and you can reference them. So you're probably going to reference the Uniform Commercial Code, the Federal Reserve Act, the UCC, um, the, uh, sorry, the United States Code, other codes if you're in another country, depends on the context, and any other sources, any other acts or laws or statutes or, you know, 
and so on and so forth anything to or even cases that were ruled in this in favor of of your position okay so whatever you need to do like i said i personally like to do it in the footnotes and then link to because we live in the modern age i like to link to web pages with the relevant citations rather than pasting it all into the document because then it becomes really long and unnecessary but some people might want to put them right into the document for completeness that's totally cool now what you're going to do this is like the heart of the letter this is basically where you make the case where you explain in clear concise language why you are in the right and the recipients are in the wrong and therefore Anything you ask for is completely reasonable entirely within your rights, okay? But in order to do that, you're building out the case and you're just gonna state out the facts. A, B, C. I like to do a bulleted point list in order of chronologically, but also foundationally. So I'll, I'll explain you know, who the parties are, A, B, C. So I'm a party as the beneficiary, then there's the SESTK Trust, and then there's the bank or other entity or the or the judge or this or that or the other here's what happened here's what was supposed to happen here's why it was supposed to happen here's what actually happened and here's why they're you're in the wrong okay so you've built out the case so the last bullet point or bullet points or you know leading up to the to the end of the list is a proven case a to z about why you're right and why you're here to defend your rights now that you've made your case and it's crystal clear and anybody can get it a five-year-old a ten-year-old child can get it. i mean they, you want to make it so simple that anybody can get it who who fully understands all of the terminology that you're using and can and, or can you know the if you're defining terms it's all very clear now what you do is you synthesize it all together and you draw a conclusion so you're saying something along the lines of as per the preceding facts that i have outlined here you meaning the recipients, are in breach of our contract. You have committed securities fraud. You are committing trust fraud, and so on and so forth. You have violated such and such laws or statutes that are of which you are under their jurisdiction. Okay? And the result of such violations and the result of your actions has some, some kind of harm has been caused to me as the beneficiary. It could be a financial loss. It could be some other kind of loss. It could be loss of freedom, being in jail, uh, you know, some combination of that, loss, loss of something else. Usually it's a loss of, of property or freedom These are, or, or money, which being property, right? So usually it's a combination of losing some property or some freedom or some combination therein, okay? So you're stating clearly and you're demonstrating why how that has come to cause that harm and why it was wrong for them to do that right and you're just summarizing that you're wrong and i'm right based on all the things that we just saw you're you're an immoral scumbag <laughs> now you're not going to say that remember you're always going to be honorable but that's what you're thinking hopefully you think this this person's an immoral scumbag piece of trash who do they think they are they're just a bully they're completely full of shit putting them in their place. You need to know that. You need to know you're right and they're wrong. But you're being very honorable about it. You're simply, you're simply stating it as though it's a very matter-of-fact thing, which it is. It should be, if you're right. Now what you're going to do, and this is getting close to the end of the letter, and it, you know the, the length of the letter, somebody's out there saying, well, how long is this letter going to be? It sounds like it's going to be pretty long. It could be. I've written conditional acceptance letters that are anywhere from 6 to 12 pages long. Some people have written over 20 or 30 pages. It depends on how complex the conditions are or the facts. The facts are usually what take up most of the time. Most of the uh, There is some boilerplate, but it's mostly the facts that can take up a lot of the space. So I don't know. It's as long as it needs to be. I personally try to make mine as concise as possible and avoid unnecessary language, but still going to be you know five six seven pages at least depends on the scenario but what you're going to do in this close to the end of the letter you're now listing you're going to say something like therefore or based on all of the proceeding i conditionally accept your offer to pay this parking ticket to decline my credit application to honor this fee or schedule to appear in court to to 
you know, leave the premises under eviction, whatever it is, to pay this child support. So you say, I hereby conditionally accept your offer to do something, whatever they're asking you to do, under all of the following conditions. And then you outline the conditions. Now they need to be reasonable based on the facts and what is right. In other words, what is their duty, their fiduciary duty as trustees? What are they expected to do under the, the laws that they have agreed to, to be under in their jurisdiction or the terms of the contract that is already in place? So you're, it's going to be very reasonable, but because they're in the wrong, here's the, here's the word magic, because they're in the wrong, they'll never be able to fulfill those conditions. It's impossible. And you may add some conditions where you need clarification because if you know that they're being deceptive or coercive, then you have a right to clarify what's actually happening. So you may ask them to prove certain things, to provide documentation, to provide proof that they have a certain authority to do something, even do something. So you're going to add as, you're going to provide as many relevant conditions as you can. Now, ideally, you want to set it up so that if they if they capitulate then they're going to be able to fulfill the the thing that you really want so for example i mean this is really the outcome right so if you're being wrongfully in prison the outcome you want is you just want to be set free but you want your freedom back so that's what you really want so that needs to be somewhere after these conditions as if in the event that you don't agree to all of these then here's what you agree to you know, essentially you're saying by not agreeing to all my conditions, you're basically saying that I'm right and you're wrong. So because of that, you agree to release me from prison, to cancel the debt, to cancel this parking ticket, to grant me the credit card that I applied for, to whatever it is. Like it could be, you know, whatever, whatever the conditions, you know, the original claim is. You're just looking for the best scenario in the honorable way. Look, I'm, I'm acting here in good faith. If you just grant me the credit card line of credit that, you, that I have a right to as the beneficiary of the trust that you wrongfully denied me, taking away my rights under, within the framework of this jurisdiction, then uh, just grant me the card and we'll call it a day. I won't charge you any penalties. I won't charge you my fees for wasting my time. And we won't have to go to court. You're taking the same position with them in reverse. You know, just do this simple thing that I'm asking you to do and we can just forget all the rest and just move on with our lives, which is what we really want to do. I mean, you don't want to be wasting your motherfucking time dealing with shit that you don't have to. So you want to make it a super simple. Look, just fulfill these conditions. We can call it a day. You won't hear from me again. You'll, you, you will have considered as being performing your duties under this contract, right? Because remember, this letter is a contract. So you need to make their performance feasible but it needs to align with what, you're, what you have a right to as part of the outcome. And you have a stipulation in the event that they just won't do that, any of that, then you reserve the right to sue them, to make a claim in federal court, right? To, get, you know, to put a lien on their property, whatever you gotta do to seek remedy. And we call it remedy, because we're remediating the situation. So whatever you have a right to do in the conditional acceptance that you say, you know, you're not accepting my conditions, which are all very reasonable based on the facts. I've been very reasonable here, very clear. This is all you had to do to fulfill your fiduciary duty and to honor our contract. But because you won't do that, now this is going to happen. Lean on your property, other penalties assessed, whatever it is, right? And I will, I will either put a lien directly on your property or I'll take you to federal court and sue you in federal court. Okay. And by that time, because you have sent them three notices and everything will be very documented, it'll be an open and shut case as long as you do everything correct. You'll, it'll be an open and shut case. And you'll be able to win, as many people have. So ultimately, the, condi the, the conditions are going to be impossible for them to fill because they're basically predicated on the fact that they're lying, like they're not being honest. Okay, and they won't be able to do it. Again, thinking back to the parking ticket example. Prove to me that you have a right to charge me for the use of that property. Demonstrate clearly how you're going to use that money because it's my money. If I'm going to pay you, I need to know where it's going. 
they'll never be able to fulfill that. So you just give them a fallback. Just cancel the whole parking ticket and we'll call it a day. You know, or if you want to, you can charge, assess a fee for waste, having wasted your time. Cancel the parking ticket and you'll all, only owe me $1,000 for wasting my time. That's my attorney's fees for being the attorney, in fact, for my SESTK trust. Our attorneys the, who represent other people, they charge exorbitant fees. Charge a fee. It's your time. They're wasting your time. They have stolen your time. Do you not get that? They have stolen your time. So you deserve, in order to make justice here, to bring things back to the right, there needs to be some kind of compensation for them having wasted your time. Okay, that's why you charge the fees and the penalties. And that's why in the UCC and in the US Code and in the Federal Reserve Act, there are clauses like the Federal Reserve Act Section 29, there are clauses that specifically outline penalties for, for acting, you know, for acting wrongfully, for violating the terms of the contract, for, for acting in a way that it goes against the rights of the individuals involved. Okay? So it's, you really got to dial this in in this part of the letter. And then it's sealed. And they're reading the letter, knowing that you're right, knowing that everything you said is true, everything is correct, and knowing what their duties are, they're going to have no choice but to capitulate if they want to avoid penalties. Okay. Canceled. The debt is canceled. The bill is canceled. The parking ticket is canceled. Okay. You don't have to pay that fine. Okay. You're free. You can, you know, you, you're out of prison. You're out of jail. Okay. The charges have all been dropped. You don't owe anything. We'll call it a day. That's it. Now, sometimes they'll do that but, and you won't have collected those fees. So it's up to you if you want to continue to press forward. If you say, you know what? In good faith, they accepted, all my, they accepted what I really wanted, the outcome I really wanted, which was to get back my, my freedom. And uh, we'll just forget the rest. I'd rather focus my energy on something else than trying to go after that money. Money is just a threat. You know, it's kind of a way of you saying, this is an option that I, this is a right I have, and I'm going to exercise this right if you don't, if you don't perform per our contract. But you don't have to do that. You could just be like, okay, I consider it a win. Next, who's going to try to take away my rights next? Let's deal with it. So that's up to you if you want how much you want to be a stickler on that. But you have every right to, right? Especially if it's in, if, and that's why it's important that you stipulate that in, in the conditional acceptance letter. But whether you actually do that or not, it's entirely up to you. You know, just how, how, how far you want to take it. Okay, so I kind of explained this slide before we got to it. So after you explain the conditions, you say what's going to happen if they just ignore you or refuse to fulfill the conditions, right? And, and they haven't made a counteroffer, right? Because if they come back to you and ask for clarification or make a counteroffer, then the ball's back in your court, right? Because they're playing the game. They sent the ball back to your court. So now you've got to respond, right? And you have to review what they said against the facts, against the law. Is it against the statutes? Is it truthful? Are they being honest? Are they correct? Or still, are they still full of shit? And then you have to counter it, right? So, but in most cases, when they know that they're in the wrong and they know they don't have a case, you know, they're either going to capitulate or they're just going to try to ignore you, thinking that you're not really serious. Or they may just say, you know, we're not going to do it, right? And you'll have a choice. You'll have to continue to advise them and continue to move forward. Now, someone might ask, should I notarize my or witness my conditional acceptance letter? It's probably a good idea. I can't, I can't tell you with 100% certainty that it's required in all cases. It might be a really good idea, right? It will definitely give more power to your letter, having either witnesses I mean, notarization is a form of witnessing. It's a more of an official form of witnessing. So it's a good idea. Yeah, so I mean, if you can do that, great. If you're just, if, you, if you're sending out a bunch of them and you just can't, if you, for whatever reason, you don't want to do that or can't do it, I mean, again, you're, you're going to have to test it out. I think it's, 
probably a good idea to use this as much as possible. That's just all I'm going to say, but I, I can't say there's a hard and fast rule here. Um, you certainly want to demonstrate that you are the person that you say you are, and that can help, right? You could also provide some supporting documentation to prove that you are the person, that, you know, the, the living man, uh, the beneficiary that you are saying that you are. So take that into consideration, but I'm not going to give you like a hard and fast, like it must be this way. I also recommend if you're going to start to follow different processes, like once you start to do conditional acceptance, it's probably not going to be just one thing. Let's be honest here. If you really embrace this way of, of dealing with the constant barrage of claims against you, you're probably going to start sending more than one conditional acceptance letter. In fact, you may find yourself enjoying the process, God forbid. <laughs> so to get more organized, I definitely recommend using folders for anything you print out and then you know digitally get yourself organized. I have a spreadsheet online that I use to track all of my conditional acceptance letters to a lot of detail, I know exactly where I am in the process, you know, first notice, second, third notice, and so on and so forth. I know the responses, how long it took them to respond. Did I receive remedy? If I did, what was the remedy? If I not, you know, so on and so forth. So definitely keep track of it. It'll just make your life easier. It'll make you, you know, it'll be more professional and ultimately it's going to save you time and headache keeping track of all the moving parts because it can be a lot, right? But if you're super organized, then you can just do what you need to do and then just forget about it. You don't have to spend so much mental energy on it because that's what you're trying to avoid is like having to spend so much energy that you're constantly obsessing about it because you're not sure where you are in the process or you're worrying about it. So don't do that. So get organized, right? Create some processes around that. Now, I promised you guys, and by the way, this is not going to be the last video I do on this topic. This is just the first. So this is really just the start rather than you know the whole thing so don't you know just let's just make sure that's really clear but i did want to give a special shout out to three gentlemen and interestingly enough they're very different three very different gentlemen who most influenced me in my study of this material and they're all very different from each other that's what's interesting but they have something in common in my estimation they're all three very honorable they care a lot, they have experience, and they want to help. They want to help people be free. So we, we share that value in common. So special shout out to Brandon Joe Williams, who hopefully is going to be actually, I'm going to interview him coming up soon on this channel. So Brandon Joe Williams, he's actually the first guy that introduced me to this. And he's the one who introduced me to Mansa, Mansa Mahatha, and Christopher Hauser. Okay, so Brandon Joe Williams, again, I'm going to have links to their YouTube or their Instagram or their, you know, websites, whatever you need to know. It's all going to be in the bibliography, so don't worry about it. It's all going to be there. Um, so Brandon Joe, he introduced me to Mansa and Christopher Hauser. And each of these gentlemen is approaching this from a slightly different perspective. Mansa doesn't even really call it conditional acceptance. He doesn't really focus on that. Uh, but Brandon does, and Christopher talks about it a lot. In fact, I probably learned more from Chris about conditional acceptance than, than the other two. But there are related topics. There's a constellation of topics that all ties into the same. It's all about becoming free. It's all about implementing your sovereignty in in the framework of what's going on in the world in a practical way. Check out the work of these fine gentlemen. I hope you enjoy it. I think you'll like it. They're they're very uh, they're very funny. They're they're very they're great gentlemen. I mean, I haven't met them in person, but just from watching scores of videos from each of them, literally, I've watched you know more than probably more than twenty videos from each of them, and I can tell you. Everything I've said about them is true, and you'll pick that up, right? You just need to see who resonates. Who resonates, which path resonates. What's, where do you want to take this? Now, I am going to be doing an advanced workshop. And the reason why I want to do this is there's always going to be a small number of people who want to take this to the next level and want to really dive in deep, and they want 
to be in a supportive environment where we can win together, right? And they, and they may want some hands-on feedback and so forth. So the way this is going to work is all this information is free. And it will continue to be free. And every future video I'm going to make on these topics will always be free. Free knowledge, free knowledge. The only price is, of course, you've got to spend the time and pay attention. Now, if you want my time, my time does have a price on it. Now, I'm, I'm making it super reasonable for now to start because I haven't done a lot of these workshops. So I'm, I'm, my time is valuable, but I'm making it easy because I want to make it easy for people who do want to do this. Okay? So you're paying for, the, for access to me. Right, not for the knowledge. You're paying for act for my time and my focus working with you in a small group. So every workshop is going to be limited to ten people per session, maximum ten people. It's going to be the first Saturday of each month, twelve p.m. Eastern for two hours. Now I'm actually thinking of making it more like three hours because I think I think you know we'll see somewhere between two and three hours. Uh, and there's going to be, for example, a training section for an hour. You know, workshop part and then Q&A, something like that. So training, workshop, Q&A. So we can really cover all the bases. And I'm going to walk you through the process step by step how to craft your conditional acceptance letter. I'm going to show you examples of my letters, what I've used, um, and we'll talk through some scenarios, okay? And then when you have a scenario, we can talk through and I can point you through specifically where to go research the statutes, the applicable statutes or codes that are going to be most impacting your specific situation. So that's how it's going to work. First Saturday of each month. If you want to enroll, it's going to be $93 to attend the entire workshop per attendee. And there'll be some link below. Probably for now, I'll just say, you know, send me an email because I haven't set up a um, an actual page to enroll. At some point, I may set up a little page you know where you can go and enroll but for now it's probably going to be you know read the notes below but it's probably going to be just shoot me a message on social media or on email and just say hey dave i want to attend you know such and such I actually prefer it that way because i want to kind of vet you know i want to kind of vet people as they're coming in just to make sure that people coming in are, are really serious about this not going to waste anybody's time not going to be troublemakers or you know lazy ass lazy asses who aren't really there to do the work they just they're trying to look for a quick fix so i probably want to qualify a little bit and honestly if, if there's just one person who enrolls i'm still going to do the workshop so if you're one person and you enroll that means it's great for you because you have one on one session for me for three hours it's like you know 30 bucks an hour to get my time it's not always going to be at this price but for now i'm going to keep it nice and low make it easy for people to enroll because I, I want to make it, I want to make it a feasible, okay? But you don't need that session. Like you don't need to be in that session to to master this or to get on the path to master. You just need to start studying, study, 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 follow the links, research, do the research, get it. You know, start to grasp the concepts, and then at some point just start taking action. You know, this is just like you want a little, a little more of a white glove treatment, I guess. And I'm happy to do that because I want you to win. I want you to reclaim your freedom. I want you to, to master defending your rights and to master the use of high word magic to do that through the conditional acceptance. And I'm going to continue to teach other related concepts in other videos, but including more on conditional acceptance, of course. But this has been, I think, a really good introduction to the topic. And just comment below. Any questions you have, you can shoot me an email, david at freedomvibe.art. Um, you can even send me a text. You can send me a message on social media. You know, just make make the questions worthwhile. Like, don't just send, you know, dumbass comments. Well, yeah, how do I do it? How, does this really work? <sighs> I mean, come on. Send intelligent comments. If you want to have a conversation with me about it publicly, you know, for example, if you have a podcast or something, yeah, I mean, send me a message. I'm happy to do that. I don't really have a podcast. This is more like my channel is more just presentations. But uh, if there's a context to have a conversation through a podcast, I'm happy to do that. Bottom line is, all I, all I really want to do is, is to help more people basically become free and re, you know, regain 
full use of all of their rights, all of their infinite rights, your infinite rights. That's really all I want here, okay? So I'm gonna leave it at that. I appreciate you. If you stuck with me all the way to the end, wow, you're in like the point, point zero one percent because so few people make, can make that commitment. So I, I wanna just congratulate you. So share this video with anyone that you feel could benefit from it. Send a like, smash that like button, write a comment below, anything at all, even just a thank you or I, I hate you or whatever. I don't care if you're a hater or a lover. It doesn't matter to me. Just write something on the video. And of course, I will see you again very soon. Take care.